when you're seeing some froth come out of the market, a lot of SPACs that had peaked coming down from some of those recent highs, why is SPAC still the right way to come to market? Well, remember, SPACs are faster. They are, um, they negotiate directly with the client. So the company gets to talk to the big investors and, and negotiate with the big investors. And those are the people who invest in the pipe. So it's fast and you negotiate directly to investors. And basically it's just another way of doing an IPO. So it's incredibly yep. attractive uh, to the company and to investors. So it works well for both. Howard, a couple of points on that. First of all, some of the heat's coming out of the SPAC market. Is that a good thing? And do you think ultimately the SPAC structure will end up getting reformed? Is the current format the right way to go? So let's take the, the last one, which is, you know, the SPAC market is really an existential threat to private equity. I mean, remember, private equity was the only way companies like this could raise money. Now the public gets a chance. I mean, yes, are, these, are many of these companies earlier in their life cycle than, say, a traditional IPO? But this is a way for investors to get in earlier and, and to get in where, let's say, the private equity guys would get 2% carry and 20% of the profits. Now investors can go invest in these companies now. And like Satellogic, right, they raise enough money to launch 300 satellites to take a daily image of less than a meter, like a really close image of every square inch of the earth. I mean, think of that for ESG. Think of that for you know, insurance companies and farmers, it's, it's amazing. And so people can invest in it now. And with respect to fraud, look, IPOs have always, this is just another way of doing an IPO. So when the IPO markets are frothy, the SPAC market's going to be frothy when they both sort of more ordinary SPACs are doing. We want to get more to the specifics of that Satellogic deal. One more sort of broad question. You mentioned how fast they are. Does that mean that regulators have not been able to keep up? No, I, I think what happens is in, in, an, in an IPO, you file your documents and you have to wait, you know, you have to go through like a nine month process before you can go public. Whereas with a SPAC, since the SPAC is already public, you can put out your information directly to the investors and investors can decide in a SPAC whether they like the company you want. So here you're bringing your company out. Now, everyone can take a look at Satellogic, take a look at the business, take a look at the answers. And if they decided they didn't want to invest, they could have their $10 back. I mean, that's amazing for a SPAC, right? That SPAC investors get the option to take a look. Now, I think Satellogic is amazing. So I, Cannabis Fitzgerald, we invested uh, $25 million in the company uh, at, at the pipe, meaning at $10. We just bought $25 million worth because we think this company is going to do incredible things and really change the course of data from space. I mean, I hate to say it, but space is the final frontier and... Uh, and I think this is incredibly exciting. The, the space market is vast, $140 billion addressable market annually yep. for the data coming out of space. Amazing. Howard, you, you talked about this being a huge advantage when it comes to ESG for farmers, for insurance companies. Do you think governments are going to be comfortable with a private sector company taking this kind of level of detail uh, over their country? Do I, what do you think the, the kind of security pushback could potentially be here? Well, so the United States, so the history of satellites was basically someone would build a satellite for $800 million, and the United States would buy, the United States military or the government would buy all of the data coming out of those satellites. Now, you know, Satellogic has taken it to another level. So before Satellogic, it would cost about $10 million to get a satellite in space. And it would take about 30,000 kilometers a day in images. Satellogic costs less than a million dollars to get it in space launched. And they just launched four on June 30th. To totally cool to watch, by the way. SpaceX did it. It was amazing. And they take 300,000 square meters of, uh, of, of data. So every government that has not had a satellite up until now is now going to buy satellite imagery to watch its borders. So you know that's a great market of all these governments watching their own borders, because right now they couldn't afford it, right? It wasn't available to them. So I, I think it's it's gonna happen. Like this stuff is happening. There are people taking pictures of, of my, you know, of my house all the time. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't even stop a drone from flying over. So there's nothing you can do. Well said. You mentioned that you put a lot of money into this into this company. What percentage of the company will Cantor Fitzgerald now own? Um, I guess we'll own probably about 5%.
I think all in with all of our investments, uh, I think we'll probably be close to 5%. I'm, I'm really excited about this company. 300,000 kilometers for each satellite. It's, it, and the images, by the way, you saw that image of the, of the, of the blockage of the canal. I mean, these are, they're, they're so close, you can count the number of containers on the ships. You can, you can tell what kind of plane it is in the airport. And so that kind of data, once you drive that through data analytics, you can really, it's amazing. I mean, if you think about it, uh, I mean, look at that. That is incredibly close image from space. And the cost is so low now that it's available for every farmer on the earth. And that's incredible because the farmers need to know, you know, where is the infestation? Imagine, you know, you have a huge farm, you drive around the outsides, you can't see that the middle is turning brown. And these, these things are going to change the way the world works. And they're going to prove, finally, prove because a photo every day, images every day of the ice changing in the Arctic Circle. Finally, you'll have a daily image showing the effects of climate change. Howard, we've only got a few minutes left. There's a couple of other questions I'd like to ask you, uh, a little bit tangential, but I'm curious. Um, my understanding is you guys uh, are going back to the office. Um, we're watching a real divide develop on Wall Street between companies that are saying, you've got to get back to the office, we want you here, and other companies are saying, we can give you some flexibility. And it's turning out to be potentially a, a real division in terms of um, attracting talent. What, what, how do you see this developing? Are your plans changing? How critical do you think this is going to be for your firm to attract talent, the way you approach this? Well, you really, um, you had a great view of what people could accomplish at home. So what we found and, and what the Wall Street firms and trading firms are going to find is that you can't manage risk the same way people are trading and taking risk from home. You just don't have the same infrastructure of compliance, of oversight, of risk management. So having your front office personnel uh, in financial services work from an office. Now, they don't have to necessarily come to our New York office. We have regional offices. We have all suburban offices. We, I had them, I, I built them after 9-11 to, uh, I used them as a recruiting tool to have people come back to work. You know, you could work in the local New Jersey office, the regional suburban office, uh, Mondays and Fridays, and we made them perfect. So those offices, of course, are chock full right now, as you can well imagine. But I think front office going back to work is very important, and you're going to see that happen. Now, your support staff, your, your techs, your accountants, those people, if they've proven they can work from home, I think you're going to see a lot of people offer a more flexible environment for them, and that's going to be a competitive advantage for the people who offer that. So I think that's our model, which is our front office people are going to be working from the office, and, our, and all of our support staff, our tech people, our accounting staff, compliance, all, all the people who can lawyers, all the people who, who think for a living and, and, and do work on computers for a living, we can be more flexible. A lot has changed since the 80s, particularly the frustration over work hours. How are you responding to junior bankers who come to you and say that they are experiencing burnout? <laughs> you know, I, look, there are certain paths. Like, you imagine uh, doctors who are residents and they said they're burning out because they have to be in the hospital all the time. I mean, there's there's a path to becoming an investment banker that requires an enormous amount of work because the clients want documents turned to get their deal done by Friday, right? Like, like the Satellogic deal wanted to go public on Tuesday. And, and that meant everybody, including me, had to work all weekend to make sure we got all the documents signed. It's, it's sort of, you have to know that's coming. So bankers, young bankers who decide that they're working too hard, <laughs> they should choose another living. It's my view. These, these are hard jobs. You want to be a doctor, you're going to work hard when you're young. You want to be a banker, you're going to work really hard when you're young. You should know it going in and, and make those decisions in life. To, to complain about it after you got this great job, I don't know, it just seems a little silly to me.